Welcome to Kong's Port After Dark. With me, Alan Gallant. And a whole host of things that go bump in the night. Well, how you doing, dearies? This is Alan Gallant. I'm uh, coming to you from one of the upper back rooms in the Collins Part Inn. Uh, rumor has it that a fellow by the name of Christopher Jennings once stayed here and uh, tore the place to smithereens. However, I put it back together in a fair way, as you can see here, um, various collectibles and posters and wall hangings and the such, um, covered up all the holes in the walls left by some animal that had been in here at some point but at any rate i'm here because this is collins part after dark uh, i was born in bangor maine uh, long too many years ago uh, as you might be able to tell i'm a native new englander northern new england not quite down east, but pretty down close. And in fact, I actually talk like this. I used to talk more like I talked before, but um, I've spent a lot of time in and out of classrooms and in and out of the state of Maine where I was born and raised and spent the first 40 years of my life. I now live in sunny central Florida and um, have been down here for about 20 years. My experience with Dark Shadows began in 1967, episode 172, I didn't know that at the time, of course, uh, in which um, there was a tape recorder towards the end of the uh, episode that was supposed to have a seance that incriminated Laura the Phoenix but unfortunately there was nothing on it but the sound of crackling fire i remember that fairly vividly even though i didn't watch another episode or, or don't remember watching another episode for quite some time that fall i went to school i went to first grade at the glenburn elementary school which is a small town outside of bangor maine in which i grew up and at that point um I was anxious about school and really committed to figuring my way around a schoolyard. Uh, since we didn't have kindergarten to sort of ease us in, first grade was it. Fortunately, I had an older brother who was in eighth grade at that time. He used to sort of escort me to the school. Now, I never ran home from school to watch Dark Shadows when I finally did start watching it in 1967. I didn't have to. I lived right next door to the school and all I had to do was sort of walk across this rock wall with a bunch of hedgerows and trees and so on and a little path through it directly into the parking lot of the Glenburn Elementary School. I have vague memories of 1795, uh, so I'm pretty sure I was watching it semi-regularly by that time, but I do know for sure that by 1968, a whole bunch of us friends, same age, slightly older, were talking it up every single day and watching it every single afternoon. Sometimes I'd have friends over to my house. Sometimes I would watch it in the summertime. I would get to watch it at a friend's of my brother's house who had color television sets, which was a real treat because my place only had black and white until 1973. He had an old 100 pounds, or it seemed like 100 pounds, seemed like 100 miles, uh, old Zenith portable. The only thing portable about it was that it had a handle on top. It was heavy, but it was a 19 inch black and white, stood on a little metal stand, and I watched Dark Shadows faithfully every day for the last two and a half, three years the show was on. Um, had a lot of good times. 
Um, it really inspired me. It inspired me in terms of history with all the time travel in it. It inspired me in terms of my career. I've been uh, involved in the theater uh, one way or another since 1982, so that's 41 years. I started my career in the theater as a technician, ran lights, ran sound, built sets, did all of that sort of thing. Uh, migrated into uh, onstage work as an actor around 1986 and did that for about 25 or so years. Um, created a lot of fun roles, had a great time, did a lot of summer stock theater down near where Collinsport is supposed to have been actually uh, in the Bar Harbor area, a little town called Soamsville, Maine. It's, I worked uh, summer stock there for 17 years. I did a number of small, uh, what, what's called little theater productions uh, in Maine and New England and did some touring children's theater as well uh, before moving to Florida in 19, uh, in, uh, before moving to Florida in 2003 to go to graduate school. I'm currently working as a technical director at a small musical theater in the central Florida area and I also teach at a local college uh, uh, theater appreciation and also speech, lots of speech, lots of uh, oral calm uh, and have enjoyed doing that for uh, many years now and hope to continue for many years. Um, so that's kind of me in a nutshell. Uh, I went away from Dark Shadows when it went off the air, of course, everybody did. And all I had were a few of the paperbacks and a few comic books and a few small things like that. I wasn't a big collector back in the day as I've become since. I started the collecting probably around 1989, 1990 when MPI Home Video put everything out on VHS and started to uh, issue uh, four tapes per month. And I had a, uh, a video rental store near where I lived in Bangor, Maine at that time. And so I would go down there once a month and rent out the four videos and watch them and just soak it up and be reminded of things that I'd totally forgotten about. Uh, for instance, in today's podcast, I'm going to go over episode 554, which is an interesting episode. Uh, but I didn't remember a lot of the details about that particular um, 1968 storyline that uh, that began at that time or was in that storyline. Uh, I didn't remember Nicholas Blair. I didn't remember uh, Tom Jennings. And, um, you know, the idea that uh, Angelique was a vampire I had vague um, memories of. In episode 554, which was taped on July 25th, 1968, and it aired on August 12th, 1968, was sort of a, it was a, the beginning of a new aspect of the 1968 storyline. By that time, uh, a lot of things had happened. The Cassandra storyline and, and all of that had happened. The dream curse and all of that. And then finally, Cassandra was vanquished and sent back to the lower regions um, uh, where uh, Diabolos was probably waiting for her to explain herself for a while. And uh, then we had, you know, Nicholas Blair shows up one of my favorite characters and one of my favorite character actors from that time, uh, Humbert Allen Estrado, portrayed him. And uh, sure enough, he was there to figure out a way to get Cassandra, alias Angelique, alias Cassangelique, back into the real plane, the real world plane, and uh, to uh, raise some more hell in Collinsport. This um, episode, 554, is also pivotal in that it introduces handyman Tom Jennings, who becomes a real um, marauder, if you will, and a sexy vampire for a lot of the show's fans, and also uh, uh, introduced him as, as an actor that would play uh, a number of roles over the next few years. But Tom Jennings was interesting uh, because 
he's attacked in episode 554 and we haven't really seen anything of Angelique as a vampire, but we've been given hints throughout the early part of the episode. Um, basically, at, at the top of the episode, Barnabas and uh, Jeff Clark are looking for Victoria Winters, who's been kidnapped by none other than Adam, of course, because he's mad because he wants a mate. And um, meanwhile, there are dogs howling all over the place and and... Barnabas is freaking out because he hasn't heard dogs howl since he was a vampire. Uh, it turns out, as we discover uh, in subsequent scenes, that Nicholas Blair has a coffin in the basement of his house. And that coffin uh, is referred to uh, as containing Angelique. We don't see her yet. We don't see her until subsequent episodes, but soon. But we know she's in there. And we know this is because Tom Jennings walks into the room. He's the handyman. He's checking out all the electrical wiring and the plumbing and all of this sort of thing. He walks right in there before uh, uh, Nicholas has a chance to sort of lock the door and uh, discovers the coffin and he's freaked out by it and Nicholas realizes that well something's going to have to be done but he plays it cool until Tom leaves and then he says oh too bad you had to open that door and let's go discover Angelique's coffin so we hear the name we know it's her coffin and uh, in the next scenes Poor Tom gets attacked by the unseen Angelique, but we are sort of made to be aware that this is likely what's happening here. And Jeff Clark discovers him, thinks he's dead, turns out he's not, uh, but uh, he's almost dead, that sort of thing. And Nicholas is, you know, off in the bushes somewhere saying, and so it has begun. So we know big trouble is coming. To Big C, Collinsport, and Colin Wood very soon in the personage of Angelique the Vampire. It's a great episode. It's got a lot of cool stuff in it. It's uh, It only uses like three sets in the whole episode, so it's very economical in terms of that. The Wood set is used uh, for a number of scenes. Uh, the uh, basement of Nicholas's house by the sea is used in a single scene with the ante room with the coffin in it. Uh, and then also in finality, the, uh, the Collinwood foyer is used or foyer, whichever you prefer, uh, is used. And um, that's it, that's the whole thing. And everything is done uh, and filled to the brim with the acting uh, chops of all the people that are involved in it. It's it's Chris. Uh, it's um, Don Briscoe's very first uh, day on set. Uh, interesting sidebar. Briscoe was on set that day for the first time, and uh, also there were, um, you know. Um, Grayson Hall was there, Jonathan Frid was there, Humbert Estrato was there, and, and um, Roger Davis was there as well. And after the taping of the show, they all got together. This is July 25th, mind you. They all got together and um, they sat for an interview. And the interview was given by this radio personality from WEST radio in Eastern Pennsylvania by the name of Ron Berry. Interesting side note, Ron Berry is actually, his name, full name was Ron Berry Klugman. And Ron Berry uh, was a big time Dark Shadows fan. And so he had an opportunity to come to the studio. And the reason that um, there's a major interview that was recorded and it's up on YouTube and I'll, and I'll put the, um, I'll put the YouTube Addy in the comments section or in the uh, uh, description section, actually, uh, uh, before I post this. And it's an interesting interview and it's kind of lighthearted in a lot of ways, but it's also they, they're reflecting on what makes Dark Shadows, Dark Shadows and so on. 
and um, Don Briscoe is introduced as sort of the new guy on the block. He, he you know, describes himself as the apprentice vampire and so on. And they're having a, a great deal of levity with that. At one point, I think uh, it's Jonathan Frid that describes what they had done that day. And he describes the dogs howling and he's freaking out and all of this sort of thing, which is exactly how episode 554 begins. So I've linked up those two in terms of real world stuff. Now, what I would also like to do about 554, now that I've described the episode to you and uh, given you a little bit of world, a real world uh, link up uh, with the um, Ron Berry interview, I would also like to um, introduce into this whole thing, some of the technical demands that were uh, all about this show and particularly sound, audio, music, sound effects, that sort of thing. Uh, I'd like to show you a couple examples, but I'd also like to show you um, some artifacts that I have um, acquired uh, recently, as a matter of fact. And I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Jeff Kenny, who is a super fan and a super collector from the Midwest, who sold to me um, a bunch of what are called acetate discs. They're sometimes called transcription discs. And these acetate discs are actually made out of aluminum and they're covered in lacquer. And instead of pressed like a regular audio disc would be like a vinyl disc, uh, an LP say for instance, they, uh, they actually um, cut the uh, waves of the music or the sound effects into the layer of lacquer on the disc using a lathe. And this process was uh, done uh, quite frequently in the early part of Dark Shadows um, broadcasting history, actually for a significant part of the broadcasting history. And in uh, 1968, uh, I've got a whole bunch of these discs that have the date of 768 on July 68, which means they were either new discs or they were replacement discs for what they were doing in the audio department. Uh, now, apparently the audio was part of the, the control booth, which uh, according to an interview with uh, Nick Bezink, who was uh, chief audio engineer for Dark Shadows uh, for the latter part of Dark Shadows being on. Um, and this interview was done by uh, Penny Dreadful on her wonderful podcast, Terror at Collingwood. Recommend it, absolutely. Put a link in for her channel as well uh, at the bottom uh, after I get this thing posted. It's a great interview. He talks about working the day to day uh, with the cameras and all of the sort of values that went into producing it with lighting and all of this sort of thing. But he also mentions about the audio, a brief thing about Sybil Weinberger, who was the, um, the music director for the show. The, uh, the, and she chose the various music cuts. And at that point, in 1968, they were on discs. Uh, ultimately, I think they ended up on um, tape cartridges, but that would have been towards the tail end of the show. And these discs are all numbered and they all have like three or four or five or six cuts on each one and she would choose. And then in the uh, audio part of the control booth, there was um, several uh, turntables. And these turntables, you would queue up your um, your music cues, and they would have to go over the air live. Uh, everything about Dark Shadows, as those of you who have followed the show for many, many years know, that Dark Shadows was shot live on tape. And Dark Shadows uh, was like a little play every day. And so there was a sort of an energy of anxiety from the actors and the and, and the tech and everything else because everything had to be well rehearsed including you know where the cameras go and where all the music cues go and where the sound effects cues go and where the actors have to stand and all of this thing and the lighting had to be right and they had to move the cameras to other sets timing it out so that they would be there in time for the next shot 
and they had three cameras, which was unusual too for that day for soap operas. Three cameras is like the full blown nighttime show kind of situation. But anyway, Sybil would pick these during all through the day and then they would have to cue them up. Now, they didn't go over the studio, the, the sound cues. The, the actors didn't have any knowledge of this. This has been uh, documented also in several of uh, the Terror at Collinwood um, interviews and other interviews as well, uh, that these cues were not heard by the actors and the sound effects cues wouldn't ha have been heard by the actors either they were they were piped directly into the taped signal as the show was being taped live so basically what would have to happen if there were significant sound effects cues like the crowing of the cock and then you know barnabas as a vampire would have to react to it there would have to be somebody crouched off to the side, usually a stage manager, giving them the signal. And they'd be, you know, having a headset on or whatnot so they could hear it. And they, uh, this is the only way I can think that it would be done. And I've seen several photographs where I'm seeing stage managers crouch down. And uh, apparently this is how it would, had to be done because they couldn't hear the cues. The only time they heard sound was during rehearsals, there was something called a God mic up in the control booth that the director could then do a shout out down to an actor or a technician to, to correct or to reinforce something that was being done during rehearsal. So you, they could hear the director talking uh, during the uh, dress rehearsals and things like that, probably the camera rehearsals as well. But during the show, no, that was all, piped in on a different channel. It was not heard uh, over air in the actual studio. So that I found incredibly interesting and incredibly challenging. Now we all know about chroma key and all the visual stuff that they did that was really challenging at the time. It was very cutting edge and it was very difficult to do because it, it hadn't been done before on the scale for daytime television. So we know about that, but this is an interesting thing because it's about the sound and most people don't think about the sound. So the first thing I wanna show you is um, an opening scene here from episode 554, in which you're gonna see uh, Barnabas and Jeff Clark briefly, and you're gonna hear a lot of sound overlay. You're gonna hear music and several layers of sound effects, which, to me is incredible when I'm really listening to it. It's like, wow, they, they piped all it in live, they layered it all in. So I'm thinking they've, they've got multiple um, turntables for music and so on. And I'm thinking either they have more turntables and a different audio tech dealing with um, sound effects on discs or they have tape machines too, not sure. Perhaps somebody out there knows and, and can, uh, you know, clarify that, but um, I'm not positive. But right now, I'd like to show you a little something uh, from the top of the show and see what you think of this. The darkness that shrouds Collinwood is particularly ominous on this night, for Victoria Winters has disappeared. Two men are searching for her through the forest that surrounds the great estate. One of them fears for her life. Vicky! 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 Another man is about to know another kind of fear. A fear that will mount to terror, the greatest terror he could possibly know. Vicky! Vicky! Howling that way. I am cured of what I was. I must sense something is happening. What could it be? Why do they keep howling that way? Why?
that's quite a little scene if you're thinking about audio layering in there. You can hear the sound effect of the wind, uh, the thunder, plus you have a voiceover of Jonathan Frid as Barnabas Collins happening there, plus you've got several music cues that are happening there. And I have, I've cataloged these music cues. I, I actually um, own one of them on disc, but I've got, there were several here after the narration, of course, the Collinwood theme that's happening during the, um, during the opening show narration uh, is listed as Q number 76 uh, from the uh, Dark Shadows Complete Music uh, Library, the eight disc set. Uh, then there is a uh, something called Spooky Tension, which is from disc number 24, and it's listed as Q number 54. Now, on disc 54, Q number 193 is a theremin curtain that ends that scene. And guess what? Ooh. Here it is. I'd like to uh, shout out again to Jeff Kenny, who uh, is a uh, well known collector in fandom, and he um, sold these to me. Uh, this is disc number 54. And let me show you one of these transcription discs. There's nothing on the back of them. Okay, They're, they are coated with uh, lacquer. Uh, but it is the front that is cut. And let me see if I can get this. Uh, it's hard to read. But it is a fine recording incorporated Fine is the family name of the people that recorded this uh, and, and put it on uh, a lathe to cut the cues into it. And uh, this disc has uh, six different cues. And the cue that we're looking for, I believe, is 192. 193, sorry, 193. Uh, and I'm going to play this for you. So um, let's hear that. Here you see uh, the Fine Recording Incorporation uh, labeling here. The date, 768. It's labeled clearly Dark Shadows. It's uh, record number 54. It is 33 and a third RPM. A lot of transcription discs were actually 16 RPM in the old days, but these ones were also cut on a lathe to be used with um, a regular stereo needle instead of an acetate needle, which is why they are called acetates. And here you see the six cues and then the address down below of 118 West 57th Street. Quite a little piece. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little excursion into the soundscape. Um, we're going to do one more here just as a uh, another example, uh, and that's going to be the scene in the basement of Blair House where um, Nicholas commiserates over the coffin and then Tom discovers the coffin. Uh, in the meantime, think about this. Uh, this show used 13 different discs, music discs for this show. That doesn't include the special effects, the sound effects, uh, the voiceovers, all of that sort of thing, which were also layered into the show somehow uh, up there in that booth. Uh, this, uh, there are 19 separate cues on 13 separate discs, just to give you an idea. Let's take a look at that uh, next little piece of the show. Mr. Blair! Jennings! Oh, did I startle you? Yes, I, I didn't hear you coming. Oh, 
Oh, I'm sorry. What are you doing down here? I finished the wiring upstairs. Wondered if there's anything else around here you wanted me to do. No, no, not tonight. It's uh, it's getting late. You'd better go. Well, before I do, you mind if I take a look around the cellar? Take a look around. Yeah, I'd like to kind of get an idea how much more stuff there is to be done. Oh, I don't think that'll be necessary. Uh, this cellar is in very good condition. Well, never tell in these old houses. Might be something you never thought of. I better just take a look, make sure all the foundations are solid. Jenny! What the... What's that? What does it look like? Uh... A coffin. That's what it is. What's it doing here? I don't know. You don't know? No, I uh, found it here just as you did. I'm as amazed by it as you are. Did you tell the police about this? Hmm, it's not necessary. The coffin is empty. But I certainly do intend to get rid of it. Oh, I see. Uh, perhaps it was uh, left here by someone as a bizarre kind of practical joke. Uh, yeah, it's some joke. I agree with you. I fail to see the humor in it myself. I... Uh... I think I better be going. All right, Jennings. Good night. Good night. Too bad you had to open that door, Jennings. I could almost pity you, knowing what must be in store for you now. What you've seen, aside from the, uh, the Foley artist uh, doing the metal door and the uh, special effects sound doing the thunder, in terms of the music, in this order, we saw uh, disc number 65 was the first one that was used. And disc number 65 used cue number 247. It's that fast music that happens as we uh, are introduced to uh, Nicholas uh, in the basement. Um, and the next cue is off of disc 10. It's uh, 25A, uh, I believe. Yep, 25A. And then finally, at the end, there's a, um, on the fade out of the scene, there's a dramatic sting that's from disc 43, it's Q144. So what I would like to do now is just kind of play those for you in order, just for the fun of it, so that you can sort of hear the contact high of the original disc from the actual broadcast. First, here's disc number 65 and Q number 247. Okay, here's disc 10, uh, and we're going to do Q25A, and you may notice that, see that little mark down there? That is a uh, Q mark. It means it's a popular Q. It was used quite a bit, uh, and that is just in front of 25A. So here we go.
And you can see how these cues, some of them are atmospheric, some of them are stings, and we won't play this entire cue, uh, don't need to, but um, you get the idea of this. This would be played underneath of dialogue or underneath of thought in order to achieve some kind of feeling. And here we have the third and final disc used in this little exchange. Um, and this is a sting. It's uh, 144. And uh, let's see how that plays out, shall we? And there you have it. That's going to wrap up our uh, our little technical music soundscape sort of um, look at episode 554. If you are um, interested, uh, I'm going to put episode 554 the Tubi web address. Uh, it is on Tubi. It's one of uh, several streaming services that have it. Uh, Tubi is my favorite. That's the one that I use all the time. And I also have all of the episodes on DVD. And um, so I can watch them that way, whichever is the most convenient for me. Uh, one really cool resource is the Dark Shadows 1968 Concordance, volume one. This was put out back in the day when um, you didn't have a whole lot of other resources. Uh, there was syndication, and but uh, Sci-Fi Channel was not quite there yet, and MPI Video had sort of just uh, started out when this was printed in 1989, the first printing of it. Uh, and uh, Kathleen Resch, uh, who is a very well-known uh, member, mover and shaker in fandom, was responsible for these, uh, along with several other people that helped along the line. And um, the artist for a lot of these was uh, a fellow from Canada by the name of Warden Odson. Sadly died quite young, but uh, left a brilliant uh, body of work for not just Dark Shadows fandoms, but several others as well. And 554 is described in this book as well. It is a pivotal episode. Uh, the introduction of Tom Jennings uh, and the, um, the whole Tom is vampire sort of thing so that we have this other vampire as well as Angelique as vampire. So all of a sudden, we've got some real um, supernatural kaiju going on, even though Barnabas Collins at this point in time is immortal thanks to his connection to Adam uh, drawing the curse of vampirism from him. So this episode marks the beginning of a whole new thrust in 1968. And not everybody loves 1968. I happen to love it a lot because it was probably the first storyline where I got really, really super involved as a child at being, you know, seven, eight years old at the time. It was uh, something that helped to fire my imagination going into the 1897 storyline, which, which is going to happen right after this, a few months down the line. Uh, what I'd like to do now is give you, uh, since I've shown you uh, some fan media connected to 554 and that time. It was um, July 25th, 1968 that it was taped and August 12th, 1968 that it was broadcast. Let me show you something here. First of all, this was the newest, the latest and the greatest in the paperback novel, uh, library novel series by Marilyn Ross, who's of course W.E.D. Dan Ross, also from Canada, from St. John, New Brunswick actually, and he wrote 32 of these puppies, plus um, I think he wrote the novelization for House of Dark Shadows as well. I've got all of these books. Um, as I said, I wasn't a big collector as a child, but I got into it pretty heavy 
uh, as an adult, thanks to um, uh, some helping hands from some um, collectors and fandom, and plus eBay, of course, is a wonderful place to, to go. Uh, caveat, be careful of pricing because somebody's asking something for something doesn't mean that's what it's worth. Uh, you'll you'll uh, figure that out, I think. Uh, stay within your own budget, something that I um, have to keep reminding myself of as well. Uh, something else, of course, teen magazines. This is the August edition of uh, 16 Magazine. The uh, famous editor, uh, Gloria Stavers, used to show up at the um, studio and take pictures or have a photographer with her to take pictures. And then she would put them in the book. The big years were from the latter part of 1968 through 69 and 70. Those are the big years for all the teen magazines and afternoon television magazine and, and several of the other uh, teen and film magazines available. In this episode, or episode, <laughs> yeah. uh, seemed like a hundred miles. Um, in this issue, it's Frid, 40 spooky questions. They were just starting, so that's all they had in here. I believe, uh, let me see what I've got here. Um, it's on page 40, let me show it to you. This of course was mostly interesting. There you go, right there. Look at that. That's quite a little. That's quite a little start of fandom. Uh, I think the first mention of Jonathan Frid and Dark Shadows was in the June issue of 1968. But this one right here is when they're starting to really go ahead and cover the whole cast, as you can see the pictures down below of the cast members. So this would, was happening. At the same time as 554 uh, was getting ready to, to be taped. And then what's upcoming in the next couple of months around Halloween or thereabouts is going to be the pink Philadelphia Gum Company card series. Um, I keep these in binders. Uh, we might go over one of these in a future podcast. Uh, and I have descriptions of them, and I try to match up the, the uh, photos with the episodes in which they were shot or um, at the same time, but not on the set, perhaps. Uh, there are lots of publicity photographs that um, there are certain episodes in Dark Shadows that were very, uh, that produced a lot of publicity photographs, and uh, that's a possibility of going over in the future sometime. And uh, let me um, give credit where credit is due in terms of some of the folks that I really get into on podcasts on YouTube in particular. I also listen to some podcasts from, um, from the Apple podcasts. Uh, and the one that I listen to on both of those ends is um, the one that I listen to the most is probably um, Terror at Collinwood which is uh, hosted by Penny Dreadful, AKA Danielle Gallarter, uh, who uh, has also had uh, many years of experience uh, doing monster movie hosting. And uh, also her podcasts are great if you're into some of the academic literature influences of Dark Shadows. Uh, she talks about that a lot. And she's also a, an avid spackler. And uh, that's a term that I first heard on one of her uh, podcasts when she was interviewing uh, Kathleen Resch. As a matter of fact, Kathleen Resch mentioned it. And spackling is basically figuring out a way to make logical all the inconsistencies in the writing and uh, programming of the show. You know, sometimes there's an inconsistency like uh, you're in 1795 and then the next time you go back in history, you're in 1796 or 1797. So that's a, one of the main, uh, one of the uh, basic inconsistencies. Also, Josette Collins was referred to as Josette Lafreniere before she was, um, you know, Josette Dupre. Figure out a way to make that make sense is called spackling. And um uh, not only is uh, Penny Dreadful an advocate of that, she's 
a pretty much of a genius at it as well, as well as she covers a lot of great interviews. She's, she recently had an interview with the late, great Lara Parker. Um, one of the uh, sources that I used for this particular podcast was her uh, Terror at Collinwood episode 11, where she interviewed uh, Nicholas Bezenk, who was one of the uh, um, video honchos at the studio during the latter part of the run of the series. He also knew what was going on in the, in the booth and had mentioned some stuff about how audio worked there. And I, I kind of placed that in there. So thanks, Danielle uh, Penny, for all of that. That's wonderful. Um, also, Jewel T. Sains and his Resident of Collinwood podcast. I listened to that quite a bit. He usually has the guests Gordon Demowski and Patrick McCray on. They're, they're his steady guests. He also has from uh, the podcast Between the Shadows, he has um, Christina Pierce and um, Kara Tillis, I believe is the name. Uh, my apologies if I didn't pronounce that quite right. And um, they have great, they, they basically take episodes or sections and they just go over them. Uh, and do, you know, half hour to an hour podcast on those and just have discussions on them. Those I highly recommend as well. They're a lot of fun. Um, Patrick McRae is one of my favorite people in terms of he is one of the great wits of Dark Shadows fandom. Uh, if you've never heard him, please check him out and uh, on Jules podcast, which is again called Resident of Collinwood. Patrick also appears as guests on uh, many other podcasts as well. He's, uh, he's sought out for that. And he's also written a couple of great books on Dark Shadows, uh, the Dark Shadows Day book and the Dark Shadows Day book Unbound. So I recommend those highly. You can get them on Amazon. Please do uh, help him out. He's, uh, he's deserving of your attention, uh, as are all the rest of these people. Uh, also, um, because this was the first episode that featured Donald Briscoe, Cecil Donald Briscoe born, but now uh, was known as Donald on the show and then Don, of course. Uh, it, there is a podcast that was done a number of years ago. It's called the Literary License Podcast. And Literary License Podcast number 222. You can just search it on, on uh, YouTube and you can find it there. And it, um, it, it is about Don's, uh, you know, Don's impressions from people who knew him best. Roger Davis was a good friend of his, uh, went to college with him. And then of course they acted together on Dark Shadows. Uh, and then uh, a former um, girlfriend of his also is on that podcast and his sister uh, also did a pre-recorded uh, remembrance of Donald. Donald's story is not all sunshine and roses. Don had some problems, mental health problems. And I think it's, um, it's a really, uh, it honors him, uh, what they had done on that podcast. That's literary license podcast number 222. It covers everything. It's great talent and his obstacles in life as well. So um, I think if you want to know a little bit more about Don um, as an actor on Dark Shadows and also as a human being, that's a great one to do. I'll try to put all of these in the uh, in the uh, description below this podcast. And I think that's going to do it for uh, my very first podcast here. It uh, uh, it's a lot been a lot of fun to put this together, and I appreciate you taking time to look at it. And uh, I'll just I'll go back into my um, Denizen of Collins part here. Uh, as you can see, I got my red socks on it. That's for Barnabas, by the way. And uh, so I'll say goodbye from um, Christopher Jennings' X room here, which I, you know, picked up, uh, gussied up a little bit there, right now. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this, and uh, I won't take up any more of your time for the time being. So uh, have a good evening, have a good holiday season, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Bye. Mm -hmm.